we're talking to the Eroica Trio, and um, maybe we could start with the, where your name came from. It's a Beethoven symphony, symphony, is that right? It is, but when we were looking for a name, we, um, we wanted to find a name that felt it mirrored our style of playing, which is a very sort of passionate, very strong um, style of playing, but also Eroica, which means heroic in Italian, it has the A ending, which often in Romance languages makes it seem slightly the feminine gender. And since we were three women, we liked that, that we thought, you know, it's a very powerful word, it's a very strong word, but it also um, has a feminine twist to it, which is what we have as a trio. All right. Well, since you brought that up, I mean, is it, were you among the first all-women classical groups? The first. The first. That, that, that yeah. achieved a uh, level of career that we've achieved. And when we first were starting out, I mean, there were hardly any women playing chamber music, period, professionally. So it was, it was really, we weren't, weren't even thinking about it at the time because we were so young, we were teenagers. But we, uh, once we started playing concerts, people were really, you know, not sure about it. You know, three women, it hasn't been done. But, uh, you know, we just kept on forging ahead and it's been a, a great career. And now there are several, you yeah. know, groups with just women in it. Yeah, and we sort of, interestingly, never thought of ourselves that way, but we've been groundbreakers. And, and you know, when we were growing up, all of our idols or, or our role models were men. It never occurred to me that they were men just because there weren't any women. So I just wasn't thinking, oh, I only like men. It just happened to be that the only musicians who were really <laughs> successful were men. So, and now to be a role model for young girls is just, it's just wild. And it's so great. It's wonderful to be able to see in their eyes when they see us perform that great sense of optimism that if we can make it, and I always say that if we can make it, anybody can make it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, why do you say that? I mean, well, I think when we first started out, there were a lot of doors closed to us. Um, a lot of people really quite blatantly told us that um, when they saw our picture um, that they just didn't think that we could be able to play at a high level. And when they first said that, I thought, oh, because it's so unprofessional, because we, we were getting friends to take photographs of us for our publicity photos, because we didn't have any money, we were just kids. And, and, uh, and they were like, no, you're too pretty to be able to play well. And I just thought that was like the most asinine thing I've ever heard. It's so unintelligent and... and uh, Embarrassing for them to say it. Yeah, so we, but it was a good thing because like everything in life is a double-edged sword. It was great to have that sense of resistance because it really made us feel like every single concert we had to give 250% because we had to just knock people out of their seats to be able to get that re-engagement. And you should feel that anyway, whether you're a boy or a girl. You know, in any job, whatever you do, you, want, you should try to do it to the absolute best that you can. But it was a great reminder at every moment that there was never a moment for us to... Um, slack off because, and it forged a, a bond between the three of us as well because we felt like we were one against the world in a way. <laughs> right. so, and it made us think outside of the box too because we knew that we were never going to fit the image of a successful chamber music group. So since we already were breaking the rules, then it really was an opportunity for us to think outside of the box and to do what we thought we did best as opposed to trying to fit into what had worked before with previous generations. Well said. Very nice. <laughs> well, and why a trio? Well, for one thing, um, the repertoire, the main reason probably, is the music written for this particular combination of piano, violin, and cello is some of the best ever written. And it's also, I mean, string quartets, of course, are phenomenal and uh, fantastic music. It's, just a, it's a different kind of group when you have a piano in it because you have so much power, the nine-foot piano here, you know, the possibilities of what you can create with the piano and strings, it's just fantastic. And we can really fill large halls because of it. And you can be soloist with orchestra, mm -hmm. which string quartets don't do. And the trio repertoire is extremely soloistic, yeah. which really appealed to us because all three of us, um, we love chamber music. We love the synergy that happens when you have three people creating something. But we also really love to shine individually. And we all are soloists by birth almost, you know? <laughs> and so as a trio, you get to be a chamber musician and a soloist all the same moment. And that's really exciting and challenging as well. 
Yeah, a lot of challenges when you have piano and strings together, because every, every piano is different that I play on, and every hall is different, every stage is different, so we're always working so hard on balancing and, and making it just the right blend. Yeah, because in some ways it's easier for you because you don't have an instrument to be carrying around. Oh, it's on... great. It's a, it's, I remember one time we, we went to Vietnam and we had an eight-hour layover in Paris, and I was the only one that got to get out of the airport and into Paris. It was great. But then the flip side is sometimes yeah. I get hideous pianos and, and nobody knows why you don't sound good. And yeah, So, you know, there's trade-offs. Trade <laughs> I think the flute's the best because it's <laughs> tiny. Yeah, definitely. And, and the other thing is that every time, every night, it's a stranger. Every night, it's a stranger for Erica. You know, whereas Susie and I, it's our best friend who we're, we just are communing with. So it's it's a it's a very different thing. You Have know? you ever heard of anyone who traveled with their piano? Yes. I yeah, there are probably about five pianists who can afford to do that. <laughs> 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 and their own technicians. I mean, Horowitz famously um, had his own piano and he had, uh, and Glenn Gould also, they had the actions you know, made very light just specifically for their technique, which was fantastic. I mean, I can't imagine how luxurious it would be to know what it feel, feels like and sounds like night after night. It would be such an advantage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe just quickly you could tell us about your cello. We were talking about that just a little bit. Oh yeah, this is, a, I'm very, very fortunate. I've been given a loan of this 300-year-old Matteo Gofriller cello by the Samsung Foundation and through the Stradivarius Society. And uh, it just has this amazing sound. And, and 300 years ago, it, they were still sort of experimenting with the cello shape because it was relatively a new instrument at that point before it was the viola da gamba which was similar to the cello but you held it between your knees it didn't have the, the end pen to hold it up and it had extra strings and um, was much quieter and more muted and um, so the cello was still being developed and so this cello is very large it's actually quite a bit larger than the cellos that were then built maybe 50 to 100 years later, um, which gives it this really deep, booming sound, and it's just so rich. It's, uh, it, I'm so lucky and fortunate to have it because an instrument of this um, caliber is something that I would never be able to afford as a poor, starving musician. <laughs> and so I'm hoping the loan is indefinite, maybe like for my lifetime. <laughs> And Susie has a wonderful instrument that is hers, actually. This is a um, instrument that was made by Johannes Battista Guarnini, and uh, it was made by him in Piacenza in Italy in 1740. And this, I am happy, very happy, and lucky to say that I own it, and uh, it's my baby. So, <laughs> yep. It's funny, uh, we, we were going on a very small airplane recently, and the pilot said, oh, can, can I take this for you and put it in here? She goes, only if you treat it like your baby. <laughs> <laughs> and he did, he was good. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, because I have to buy a seat on the plane for the cello always. He has his own frequent flyer plans, cello, <laughs> Mr. Cello San Ambrogio. He gets pre-approved credit card applications all the time. <laughs> And uh, when I have a three-year-old little boy, and he just has traveled around the world with me, and uh, until he turned two, I would always have just two seats, one for me and one for the cello, and he would have to like figure out if he was going to sit in the cello's lap or in my lap, you know, and everybody always, all of the flight attendants and the pilots, they thought that was just so funny that the cello got the seat, but I think he thought that uh, Mr. Cello was um, his, his sibling. You know, he was very, uh, one time when the cello got knocked over, he started crying. He was very upset because he thought some, you know, it was yeah. really interesting. Well, one of the things interesting about you is your, the range of the material you do. We heard you do the tribute to Johnny Cash. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, so you don't just do classical music. So maybe you could, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, all, all of our, for instance, all of our CDs are, are very eclectic and have a, a huge range. We've done a Latin CD, we've done a Baroque CD, and uh, we're getting ready to record a brand new uh, CD for EMI with Susie, our first with Susie, of American music. And it's, it's going to have the, the Johnny Cash tribute by Mark O'Connor, and we're also going to have a Porgy and Bess suite, Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, arranged for us, and also Bernstein's West Side Story. So we're always recreating things or creating new pieces, um, 
know, just to put something a little bit different on the program. And we're not into having all Mozart recitals. We're, you know, we, want, we like to have music that spans hundreds of years and a real smorgasbord of, of music, yeah. So when did you join the trio? I uh, started playing with them last summer and I was officially the new violinist in September of last year. So, yay, I'm so excited. <laughs> it's your first time here. It is my first time here. I mean, it's terrific. It's such a great um, area in town. You're really all showing me what Southern hospitality is. So <laughs> it's, it's really lovely. And that's a, an Australian accent? Yes. It's um, sort of faded because I've lived here for about eight years. But um, yes, it's, it's still there here and then, here and now. <laughs> Brahms Lullaby, it was my arrangement of the Brahms Lullaby. Yeah, I, I arranged it when Erica was pregnant with her first child, and so it was a little baby present. <laughs> Another arrangement of mine by, uh, it's the, the Swan by Sassons. It's a really famous piece.